Hi, everyone. Uh, so today what we're going to do is get into a little bit of background of sociological uh, social psychology. So I hope you had a chance to you know, go through uh, the syllabus. I hope you had a chance to watch uh, the video on the syllabus in which you know, I gave you some details that I'll go over again today. But for today's purpose, what I wanted to do is use this class period to provide you some background, uh, some information about uh, sociological, social psychology. And you know, some of this will come up again when we get into the book, in the first chapter of the book. But some of this information was not in the book. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of history of the discipline and how it developed. So I always get the question from students, you know, what's the difference between uh, social psychology when it's taught in uh, the psychology department and compared to when it's taught in the sociology department? So I wanted to spend, you know, a couple of minutes kind of breaking down uh, some similarities between, you know, psychological social psych and sociological social psych, and then also look at differences as well. So I remember it was last year, I'm, I'm a faculty senate member, and so I was at a faculty senate meeting, and we were talking about uh, course names, and you know, there are some courses that exist in different departments, but have the same name. And one of the classes uh, we discussed as an example of this is uh, social psychology. And I remember uh, one of the uh, psychologists, I won't name names, uh, but he said, yeah, I know, you know, they have a social psychology class and sociology, but I have no idea what it is or what they do. So I thought that was a little bit odd, a little bit ignorant of him. Uh, so now I'll kind of break it down for you exactly how we can, you know, simply recognize uh, the differences between the approaches to social psychology. So we can say that the similarities between the two disciplines and how they approach uh, social psychology is we look at you know, how the social and how the personal uh, come together. So social worlds, uh, personal worlds, you know, what's the relationship uh, between the two? So that's a similarity that you'll get in both classes if you take it in sociology department, if you take it in the psychology department. And another similarity is, you know, what we're looking at, we're looking at uh, how the social uh, impacts feelings, uh, how the social impacts uh, thoughts and behaviors. So basically, those are a couple ways that both disciplines look at social psychology in a similar manner. So now we can look at the differences, because to really understand how they are different, we need to recognize the differences as well. And so one main difference we can say is in sociology, we emphasize more of the social worlds and how the social worlds uh, impact uh, personal worlds. And in psychology, it focuses more on uh, psychological worlds and how those psychological worlds kind of impact uh, feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. So, you know, the main kind of distinction we can say is when we look at questions about feelings, about thoughts, about behaviors, uh, the sociological perspective uh, answers the questions uh, from the outside in. And then the psychological approach answers the questions about, you know, relationships between the social and personal uh, more from the inside out. And so that's the kind of key way to look at it. And that's typically my answer to students when they ask me, you know, what the difference is uh, between the two. I say in sociological, social psychology, we look at things from the outside in, at the social to the individual level. And in psychology, it's more about the individual level to the social, um, the inside out versus the outside in. So I have an example here uh, of how this could work. So, you know, one example would be you know, how people decide to act, you know, what drives uh, actions. And so in psychology, they would look at somebody's attitudes first and how one's attitudes uh, promotes a certain action. And in sociology, what we would do is look at kind of larger forces first, you know, how culture 
shapes one's attitudes and how those attitudes then promote certain actions. And so going back to the example here, you know, if you want to look at and try to explain uh, you know, sociologically uh, voting patterns, you know, why a person votes in one way or another, first you look at somebody's culture, you know, maybe the hometown in which they were socialized. Is it a conservative culture? Is it a more progressive culture? Uh, do they, you know, perhaps attend a university where they are seen to be kind of more a liberal, uh, progressive culture uh, within the university space? Or perhaps did you attend uh, military uh, spaces? You know, if you're in the Navy, the Army, uh, the Marines, in those spaces, you typically get more conservative cultures. And so, you know, what's one's cultural background and how does that cultural background lead to your attitudes? So, you know, it's, it's not by chance if you have somebody who stays in college for a long time that more times than not, you know, they're going to be on kind of one side of the political aisle, where if you see somebody who's in the military for a long time, and more times than not, their attitudes are going to align differently, uh, politically speaking. And again, two different cultures. You know, military culture tends to be, again, more conservative, and the university culture tends to be more uh, liberal. But again, it's not 100%. You will see uh, variations. But if you're a betting person, you know, you could use those cultures as good predictors of one's attitudes and politics. So again, from the sociological perspective, trying to explain the action of uh, voting, you look at one's culture, how they're socialized, and then how that socialization shapes certain attitudes, then how those attitudes then uh, promote voting in one way or another. Now, if you look at voting as an action in psychology, they would just look at how the attitudes uh, shape the voting preferences. They kind of leave out the uh, cultural uh, dimension that we talked about and just kind of look at attitudes first and foremost and how the attitudes um, promoted voting inside out, the attitudes that are inside the person promotes the outside action of voting. Where in sociology, we look at the outside in, you know, how the outside culture shapes the inside attitudes and how those attitudes promote uh, the action. So just you know, a quick and dirty way of distinguishing the two fields, although recognizing that there is overlap in terms of the main questions being asked, but we approach the questions differently and ultimately we answer the questions differently. So now I just want to quickly go through uh, some, what I call kind of the family tree of sociological and social psychology. You know, as I mentioned in the first video for our first class, when I went over the syllabus, often we refer to this as micro sociology as well. It's a lot easier to say micro sociology than sociological sociology. So nevertheless, um, you know, we'll look at some of the people responsible for the field emerging. And you know, this is my personal family tree. Um, some people may disagree with a couple people I have here. But nevertheless, you know, I think we need to give credit where credit is due in terms of some of these ideas that are part of our uh, discipline today. So the first of which being uh, George Zimmel. Zimmel is usually somebody who's not in this conversation, but I think he needs to be part of the conversation because he's the first uh, sociologist that really did focus on that micro level where uh, other classical theorists during this time period wrote about uh, society from the top down, you know, looking at the economy, uh, looking at culture, and uh, Zimmel still talked about society, but he focused more on that individual level. And so here eventually is the first thread that begins to be pulled and developed in terms of a social psychology emerging uh, within the field of uh, sociology. So Zimmel, uh, like I say here, unlike his contemporaries at the time, you know, he did focus on social psychology uh, within sociology, where the other theorists did not, and that's important, and I'll come up uh, later. And he's not credited, again, with influencing social psychology, but definitely you can see his ideas still in the discipline today. And, um, you know, some of his studies were just fascinating. He focused on uh, individualism and basically kind of looking at how we develop as individuals 
and we can only be individuals if we're part of social situations. And uh, I just had a student recently who wrote an honors thesis on this, a really good uh, piece of work. So again, this idea he focuses on individuals becoming individuals and social interactions, you know, with whom you interact kind of shapes you as a person. It's a more sociological version of sociology uh, compared to Marx and Durkheim and uh, Weber, the other classical theorists. And then he talked about um, flirting, uh, gossip, uh, secrets, uh, fashion, you know, all of these things. So just quick examples, um, I'll look at gossip. He says gossip's an important social action uh, because it creates bonds. And so, you know, if you have nothing to talk about, and you're not talking, um, but if you have some juicy gossip and you're kind of talking to coworkers or classmates or with friends, you know, that gossip kind of brings you uh, closer together and can build a cohesion. And uh, secrets kind of work like that as well. But the secret is different in terms of you have that bond with somebody, you become closer to them if you share a secret with them. But the difference in terms of gossip and secrets is that once the secret is uh, kind of known, and once the cat is out of the bag, uh, the bond kind of disappears because you no longer sh share a secret, other people know it. So you don't have that to kind of bring you closer with somebody. So again, it's kind of you know, fascinating stuff that nobody really wrote about uh, at the time, and Zimbel did. And you see a lot of these ideas being discussed today. So let's move to American uh, sociological, uh, social psychology. And so the main people who are credited with starting uh, this thread within sociology are uh, Cooley and me. And so you'll, we're going to hear about these two people again and again throughout the semester, especially at the beginning of the semester, because they're kind of seen as the uh, founders of, you know, American sociology, uh, the founders of sociological uh, social psychology. And I kind of put this at the bottom of the PowerPoint. Uh, but I'll start off by saying that they kind of started this approach in reaction to the other classical theorists. They believed that Marx, uh, Durkheim, Weber focused too much on the top down and they ignored how social life is created from the bottom up. And so they weren't uh, trying to continue the traditions of the classical theorist, but they're trying to start a new tradition by focusing on that micro individual, uh, more social psychological level. So again, we'll come back to these two guys uh, throughout the semester, but Mead uh, and Cooley, both American sociologists, they really looked at the connection between the individual level and the social level. And Mead uh, looked at how the mind is kind of a social entity in terms of, uh, you know, I'll talk about this more in our uh, next class as well. But you know, the mind basically is a social uh, construction. Yes, it's uh, you know, one part physiological. You, know, you need the physiology uh, to be there to have the mind functioning properly. But the mind only functions uh, with the kind of social world that kind of creates it. You know, how we think, uh, how we speak, how we act, those are all uh, social creations rather than something that's innate or something inborn is something uh, simply uh, physiological. So he really looked at the connection between mind and society and he looked at how the two come together to create uh, our actions. Uh, Cooley, very similar, they were uh, friends, Cooley and Mead, uh, they were uh, kind of co-workers as well uh, for a certain time. And then when you look at uh, Cooley, you know, he's known kind of for similar ideas. Um, he kind of looked at one sense of self as a social product. So uh, Mead looked at the mind as a social product. Uh, he uh, coolly focused more on identity, one sense of self. And again, these are ideas we'll talk about later, but just as an example, uh, he believed coolly that in a lot of who we are, how we see ourselves is based upon the social feedback you receive. So, you know, if you get feedback from people that tells you that, you know, you're intelligent, you're smart, such feedback, maybe, you know, teachers telling you that you're a good student, 
you get A's in all your exams, that social feedback kind of tells you that you're intelligent and you kind of make that part of your identity. But if you don't get that feedback, if you're not getting the A's, if you're not getting the pat on the back by your teacher, you're not gonna develop that same sense of self that you're somebody who's intelligent. So Cooley and Mead are usually the ones we start with when we talk about this family tree. But again, you can't ignore Zimmel. Zimmel came before them and really was uh, so, so, uh, more on that social psychological level. So another person that's often left out, and I believe he needs to get his due credit as well, is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois, another American uh, sociologist, uh, also focused, uh, like Cooley and Mead, you know, how the social life ties into one's personal life. And specifically, uh, he looked at how the social world, uh, such as culture, such as uh, laws of society, uh, can influence one's identity, racially speaking. So being an African-American and li living during you know, these times of you know, segregation, kind of slavery, and he experienced life uh, as an individual uh, in terms of how he saw himself, how he thought about the social world much differently because of his race compared to other individuals. So he kind of looked at life social, uh, from that social psychological viewpoint and really concentrated on the variable of race as well. So, you know, as I say here, he looked at how blackness comes to define one, both social identity, how people see you as not a person, but as a black person, but also he looked at how one's a blackness influenced how a person saw him or herself. And then he also wrote about how whiteness does not do the same thing. So typically one's social identity, you know, people won't see me as a white person, they'll just kind of see me. And also I don't see myself as a white person, I just see myself as, you know, Ryan. So, you know, interesting stuff, but again, looking at how uh, the social world uh, can create a social psychological world. So, you know, usually, you know, the family tree goes from Mead and Cooley to uh, Herbert Bloomer. And so Bloomer is actually the guy who formalizes this discipline and gives it a name. He formalizes it in the sense he's, you know, certain principles of symbolic interactionism and uh, certain principles of this kind of, you know, label he provides, uh, sociological, social psychology. And so Bloomer uh, did study with and underneath a Mead. So he really tried to carry on Mead's tradition and make it its own branch of sociology. And that's what we call the branch of symbolic interactionism. So, you know, Bloomer is an interesting dude. Um, he uh, was a professional football player. So actually, you know, why he was going to graduate school, uh, why he started to work you know, as a professional uh, sociologist, he played uh, professional football uh, in uh, Chicago. So he was going to school at the University of Chicago, you know, studying under you know, George Herbert Mead. And on the other hand, at the same time, he was playing a professional football and he actually won the, uh, they didn't call it the Super Bowl you know, at the time, but you know, he won the championship in what is today the NFL, what would be you know, the Super Bowl. So I just thought that's interesting. You don't see that narrative too much. So as I say here, yeah, he did study under, uh, under George Herbert Mead at the University of Chicago, and he was heavily influenced by Mead and wanted to kind of carry on his ideas, and he wanted to formalize them into their own kind of branch of sociology. And one thing, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that these books that you see uh, from George Herbert Mead were actually not written by him. And so a lot of these books that are well known, uh, such as the reading uh, I use in my social theory class, were not actually written by Mead, but Mead's students. Um, because Mead uh, passed away before a lot of his ideas could be written down and published, what his students did uh, grad students and undergrad students, they kind of came together and uh, put Mead's ideas into book formats. But today, uh, because we have, you know, the internet and this access to information, you can actually find uh, Mead's original writings, which sometimes are much different compared to the interpretation of Mead, um, you know, through the minds of the students. And so here, 
you know, he's, in, you know, he's often in credit, Bloomer is given credit for kind of starting symbolic contractionism, but a lot of people say that he misinterpreted a lot of Mead's ideas. And uh, one misinterpretation is he really didn't capture how Mead believed in kind of a Darwinist version of the social psychological life. He believed kind of this, we try to adapt to our environments, similar to how uh, Darwin kind of talked about it. And uh, you don't see that in Bloomer. Uh, so some people say that he tried to do his best with me, but missed a boat on some things. And nevertheless, uh, you know, we'll talk about uh, Bloomer again when we get into our first chapter in the book. And so, you know, we can't talk about sociological, social psychology, uh, symbolic interactionism without talking about Irving Goffman. So again, another American sociologist. And so symbolic interactionism is a very American field compared to if you look at uh, Marxism uh, in sociology. Yeah, you find some American sociologists who follow that Marxist tradition. But for the most part, uh, the Marxist tradition is a European game where symbolic interactionism is more of an American game, although you can find you know, Europeans who kind of follow this tradition. So Irvin Goffman, um, he's often associated with symbolic interactionism, but he never uh, labeled himself as such. Uh, he kind of, he saw himself more as what he called a structural social psychologist, you know, looking at how culture and things you know, shape how we think and act. So, you know, a little bit different than symbolic interactionism. But again, you know, there is overlap between kind of what he did and the discipline. Uh, he does continue uh, Mead's legacy. So what Bloomer kind of missed, left out, you see Goffman focusing on that, you know, to, uh, for Goffman, emotions were a big part of kind of what we do and why we do it. And basically we want to avoid uh, negative emotions. We want to avoid feeling embarrassed, uh, feeling ashamed. And that goes back to Mead, because Mead believed that we try to adjust to our environments to avoid those psychological tensions. So the better off we can adjust to our environment, you know, adjusting to college life, uh, adjusting to post-college life, the less uh, tension we feel. And we want to avoid that tension. So nevertheless, you'll see some overlap there. And he's considered Irving Goffman to be probably the most famous American uh, sociologist. And, you know, I use him all the time in my theory class, my intro class, and we'll be talking about Goffman here as well. So finally, just to you know, wrap things up for today, we have the family tree with more uh, contemporary uh, social psychologists uh, within sociology. So here, you know, we have the family tree of people still kind of working and living today, kind of carrying on the traditions that we were talking about. Um, kind of people who are seen more as a symbolic interactionist, uh, David Snow, uh, he, uh, you know, we'll read about him in our book. He uh, looks at social movements and collective behavior. Uh, Patricia Adler, who's up here on the uh, top left of the screen. And Patricia Adler is a symbolic interactionist that's best known for her work on deviance. Uh, Joel Best, another guy, uh, he focuses on social problems. Howard Becker, one of my favorites, he looks at deviance as well. Uh, Gary Allen Fine, if you took my theory class, you read one of his books. Uh, he focuses more on culture. And uh, so kind of within this sociological, social psychology, but more I call the structural social psychological tradition. So more kind of the Goffman approach, even more of what maybe Mead was compared to how Bloomer interpreted Mead. We can look at people like uh, Huckstrom. Uh, she, uh, she's up here in the right corner, uh, looks at kind of connections between emotions and work. Um, Peter Burke and other kind of emotions, but he looks at identity and then uh, emotions and behavior. And the theme you see with these individuals here, uh, Hochschild, uh, Burke, you know, the emotions part, you know, how they look at emotions being part of one's work, uh, one's identity and one's behavior. And that again, goes back to Goffman, how he really focused on emotions 
And then it goes back to Mead, who didn't say emotion specifically. He is generally called an attention, and Goffman focused more on the psychological tension tied into one's uh, emotional states. So that's what I wanted to do today, kind of walk through the family tree of sociological, social psychology, and looking at how the field emerged, how it was formalized into symbolic interactionism, which we'll talk about more when we get into the first chapter of the book, and also give you kind of a brief uh, understanding of how we can separate, uh, how we can distinguish psychological social psych from sociological social psychology. So now you know more than that professor in the psychology department, how you can separate the two, although there are some uh, similarities. So we'll leave that there for today. As always, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to contact me and I'll be getting into the first chapter of our book uh, for our next class period.